say every time I come to a Don Bosco reunion, every time I hear Don Bosco's Evermore, the school anthem, I get goosebumps. And I always leave telling myself, you know what? This association is not just a mere association. It is an umbilical cord that will never, ever snap in my life. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sanjay uh, for that very honest, forthright and telling uh, uh, exposition of, of your wonderful work, particularly in communications. Thank you too for watching this ex video with the God man and not, not sharing it with the rest of us. <laughs> The, uh, we, 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 we spoke about Hanif, I was just, I, I must tell you this, Hanif, I'm sure I owe Hanif a lot of money because I, I remember in summer holidays he used to come to my house and I used to go and hide in behind the bedroom or something and my mother used to come out and ask and he'd say he owes me some money and my mother would search for me and I'd not be found and she'd give him whatever he said and she'd tell me why are you doing this I'm, but I'm sure finally I owe him some money but then it doesn't really matter because People owe all kinds of people all kinds of money, you know. I mean, in fact, I don't know if you know that J.R.D. Tata owes me some money. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, you know, I, I, I once interviewed him for Doordarshan here when he was uh, the uh, chairman of Tata and Sons and he came to our studio. And Sanjay knows this because it's a broadcast link, that's why I'm in Doordarshan after the interview, they give you a check. If it's a VVIP in those days, they give you a check for 500 rupees. Uh, and you know, he, he got a check for 500 rupees and he had to come to the duty room and collect the check. And when you collect the check, there's a revenue stamp in the government form, you know, which you have to fill and you have to pay 20 paise for the revenue stamp. And our a very conscientious duty officer, Subramaniam, I remember, he asked Mr. Tata, sir, 20 paise. <laughs> so Tata said, I have no money, I'm sorry, I don't have money. So I said, don't worry, I'll give it to you, Subramaniam, and I gave him the money. And then so Tata said, remember, young man, I owe you 20 paise. <laughs> I said, no, sir, don't worry about it. Much later, I was in Delhi, flash forward a few years, and I had to interview him again uh, for something else. And then, re remarkable, the man remembered me. He said, aren't you the young man I owe some money? I said, yes. But he said, I'm sorry, I still don't have money to give it to you. <laughs> so, I said, it doesn't matter, say, sir, because if you gave me the money, I can't tell the world, Tata owes me some money, you know. <laughs> so, so, that's how he owes me some money. Well, we will now move on to our... Uh, next speaker, who is, uh, you know, Business India in fact calls him the turnaround guy because uh, he, he, he turns around businesses. You know, that's what he does. He's a CEO of WNS Global Service, which, uh, which employs a, you know astounding number of some 27,000 people and, and spans about tw 12 countries. And he's a chairman of the NASCOM Business uh, Process Management Council. Uh, before that, he was literally the architect of the ITC's diversification strategy. Uh, he's done a, a number of things, one of his initiatives being to connect students with business. Uh, and he's, uh, he chairs the WNS Cares Foundation, which looks at uh, underprivileged ch children, tens of thousands of them across the world. And he's a chartered accountant by profession, and he's won the CA Chartered Accountant Business Leader of 2013 position by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. He's a keen cricketer, cricketer, and his name, and he, and, and he is, uh, you know, unassuming, he's quiet, behind the scenes. These people who are behind the scenes and yet do so much, you know, are so fascinating. And they have no reason to be behind the scenes. So, Keshav R. Murugesh, the CEO of WNS Global Services. Thanks, thanks a lot and frankly I'm very, very nervous to be standing here, always been nervous talking in front of a school audience, particularly a Don Bosco audience and you know, I just realized that feeling still continues. Uh, a lot of it is essentially because of the kind of people I'm sitting on this you know, stage with. First and foremost, starting with Shashi himself, my wife reminded me yesterday also that even today, he is the gold standard which, you know, women judge you with in terms of your voice and your intellect, right? 
then of course earlier when i when i was asked to speak here and i said i'll do it on behalf of my batch of 1981 that a lot of the guys are sitting there and far more qualified to be on this stage than me and then when i looked at this panel i said you know actually beyond the don bosco uh, kind of impact there's a lot in common for me with many of these people arman for example is son of akbar ibrahim my classmate and very dear friend you know we all talk about virat kohli these days but in those days you know you should watch akbar you know hit the ball on the rise right amazing cricketer and anto there just spoke about hanif and uh, microfinance he once brokered a deal between akbar and me right when he said that you pay him your 50 paisa for the bus fare and akbar will use the 50 paisa to buy an ice cream for himself and akbar will drop me in anargar ananagar at home <laughs> in his car so when you look back at this whole thing you know manga man sitting in the other side of the gate and hanif actually were huge influences for us then of course you know yg here rock star arvin swami you know i always thought he was only a movie actor until one day i ran up against him and of course he's a very humble chap so you know outside when i told him i'm very sorry that i stole this business away from you uh, he at one time was also running a very successful business process uh, uh, company and uh, yeah i never realized that he was a don bosco guy because we may have worked it out well of course he very nicely said that actually i was not interested in that business right but i must tell you that little business that i stole from him for my last company became a business that grew our valuation sorry to say it from 300 million to 4 billion or 3 billion dollars <laughs> of course and who doesn't know you know vijay amritraj you know he he you know i think i just reminded him about it uh, this morning again but everyone knows him as the and his brothers as well as the gentlemen citizens of don bosco i think very very critical very successful in whatever he has done both as a tennis player and as a commentator but one thing that will outlast even that is the fact that anyone you speak to about vijay they will tell you the true perfect gentleman right again something that came out of don bosco and again i want to start by saying that i belong to the 81 batch and like i said before that you know i have far more qualified people sitting in that audience out there who should be here and uh, i really want to thank ram kumar from our batch who is one of the key organizers i want to thank all the other organizers for you know creating this uh, event for us i want to thank every one of the teachers of don bosco school for making us you know what we are today and I want to mention that you know when you when when I look back at my days at Don Bosco and again I'm not going to spend too much time on only the Don Bosco years this session was also supposed to be about success I'm going to try and relate you know what I think are reasons for my success at least uh you know to, to this kind of audience but beyond the manga man and beyond uh, Hanif there are so many things that really influenced me out here first was uh you know my first day when i first came in for an interview father menezes was the principal in those days and my parents hammered the hell out of me in terms of how i should behave i came from a brilliant school which uh, many of my classmates also came from our ladies girls high school <laughs> right and uh, so we were already in a coed and it was a deep shock in class 3 to move to a pure boy school but we had to do it what to do and uh, so i came in for the interview and the interview was a few questions did reasonably well and uh, the father or the father principal offered me a tray full of chocolates i don't know if other people remember it but uh, i put my hand out and took one just one sweet from there and he said uh, young boy why are you taking only one don't you like chocolates take more and i said no no my fa my father said if i take more than one he'll hammer me at home <laughs> right and all through that you know the 10 minute interaction he saw that i had this nervous twitch i kept doing this 
And a lot of young people do it. And I was actually very nervous about that interview. And uh, he asked my parents, why does he keep doing that? And uh, my parents said, we don't know. I mean, you know, whenever he goes for, uh, you know, when he meets a teacher or something, he does that. Sometimes he d interacts with us in that same fashion. And he said, you know what? That is a nervous twitch. And let me tell you, your boy has got an admission now, <laughs> not because of his track record or the suite, but because of the nervous twitch, right? In six months, he will not have that once he joins the school, right? That was the commitment he made to me, and uh, it really helped. What are the other memories? You know, obviously, early morning cricket sessions, which a lot of us participated in. And I would say that that helped me to understand discipline. The fact that, you know, you woke up every morning at 5 o'clock, you ironed your clothes, you ironed your, you know, younger brother's clothes, and then you took the bus and you came to Don Bosco and met with a lot of your friends, played a lot of cricket, sweat like hell. And then, as you're trying to reach the class, you get caught by uh, Mr. S uh, Mr. Uh, Salvadore, right? Get caught for what? Because you are badly dressed. So I remember once I was having this big argument with him about, you know, how could I be better dressed because you know, when you played cricket for two hours and then going to the, to the class, you're bound to be, you know, drenched in sweat. And he said, it doesn't matter, right? You, when you come into the class, you have to be perfectly dressed. Again, it taught me something, you know, very, very interesting and important. The fact that you have to somehow manage to, uh, to you know, create your own brand. So for you know, once or twice, he would actually say, morning at nine o'clock i want to see you before you go to the class so that day you know the clothes would go to the laundry i would be neatly dressed no cricket for that morning you know go there get that certificate and then you know go to the class but again big lesson in terms of how you need to present yourself and how you need to be turned out irrespective of what the circumstances were and uh, another very fond memory was getting caught, you know, actually fixing a tail in uh, Mr. Subbarao's pajamas. I don't know who, how many of you remember, you know, Hindi master Subbarao, right? And again, what I learned from him was tolerance. You know, we were fixing, I was fixing this paper tail, and I'm a reasonably quiet fellow, but I was fixing this tail. He caught me, and, you know, he kept showing me his tongue, lifted his hand as if he was going to slap me, but never touched me, right? And again, tolerance, the fact that, you know, in spite of whatever insults or whatever mischief we created, he was always patient, you know, patient with us is something that I try to, you know, espouse as far as, uh, you know, other people are concerned. Of course, he sent me to the, to the detention classes uh, where I made lots of friends and, uh, you know, had a lot of fun, I must say. And uh, finally, being dropped, again, big lesson, being dropped from the sub-junior school team, not because I felt I was not good enough, but because I didn't present myself well enough as a brand to the very respected coach, Coach Kannan at that point in time, right? And it hurt me a lot. I remember I was in class four or something and I was dropped and you know, they, the, the, the coach would come class to class and pick up people. I was doing reasonably well, but I was dropped. And uh, so I went and asked him, why have I been dropped? And then he said, there are so many kids playing. How the hell do I know who you are? You have to come and make a lot of noise. So again, presenting your brand. I learned that day that, you know, even the best brand needs to be marketed. And, you know, it's history that later I went to a company like ITC, which, you know, controlled 80% of India's tobacco trade, but we still branded ourselves extremely well after that. So in terms of success, what is the difference really between, you know, success that we measure in school and success in our day-to-day -day life? If you just go back all those years, you will see that so many of us spend so much of time focusing on those two or three extra marks in class, right? Whereas we probably missed the bus in terms of those hundreds of marks that we ignored, which could have really pushed us into a completely different direction. Similarly, 
I really want to you know, talk about the impact that teachers and mentors have in our success, right? And I'm really delighted to know that we are honoring teachers today as well as tomorrow because the only reason all of us are successful is because of the values they gave us and the impact they've had on us. But this is something that, uh, you know, I think all of us should always remember, the fact that a teacher and a mentor you know, has tremendous influence on us and we, you know, we should always be very, very grateful to them. From my perspective, I think success essentially comes to people who live the values. You know, Sanjay spoke about it. You cannot compromise on values. The second is are people who are willing to listen, take input, take feedback and be humble about it. The third, I would say, are to people who take risk, right? You know, being safe and secure and doing things is very easy, but taking risk and walking down a path which is, you know, filled with thorns and uncertainty is, is a very different caliber and, and, and uh, you know, and a very different talent. And finally, in the world of business, the ability to carry people with your vision is very, very important. I just want to go back a few years and say that, you know, when I was uh, in school, I, I, I actually studied here till class nine and then moved to Vizag regretfully because my father took a job in Vizag. I continued playing cricket. Competition was far less than in Chennai and, you know, in Don Bosco school itself. So I managed to even play cricket for the, for the state, you know, uh, in Andhra. And I was, you know, full of josh, saying that I'm now a cricketer, I'll play for India, I'll do this, do that, and the other. I had Alan Lamb's cricket bat. I don't know how I got it, but I used to bat with his bat. And one day, Venkat Raghavan, you know, the other, the great cricketer who was a good friend of my father, who used to play in the same team as my father, the Paris team here, came to Vizag. And I asked him, Uncle, what do you think about cricket? You know, I, I have this bat, I'm playing for the state. And is this something I should continue? You know, what he told me was, you know, step back and name one cricketer from Andhra who has played for India. I couldn't name a single one. And he said, that's your answer, right? If you are good at studies, Keshav, at your peak, get out. You must know when to get out at your peak, right? Get out because, you know, it might help you. But long term, if you are not successful, you know, in this profession, you could be in serious trouble, so get out. So again, my first thing of listening to mentors, taking that advice, I'm, I'm a very good listener. I, 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 you know, heard him out. And next day I went and told my father, I'm done with cricket, right? I will now go into studies, become a little more serious with studies, and then manage to somehow pass this uh, CA exam, frankly. And thereafter, I just want to relate you know, uh, experiences I've had with, uh, you know, three companies I worked with. I worked with a company called ITC Limited. Again, not because I wanted to work there. I was actually a very successful businessman by the time I finished my CA. I was selling Dianora TVs. I was selling Honda generators. I was uh, selling, uh, I was actually the clearing and forwarding agent for all of Hindustan Zinc's imports into India. I was earning quite a bit of money, but I became a CA somewhere in between. And the person who used to read the CA journal was not me, but my mother, right? So she would flip through it and she saw on the last page, and Anto will remember this very well. So Anto and I also worked in ITC and he's also been a long-term mentor and dear friend of mine. But Anto will remember this, last page of CA journal always has an ITC ad, ITC looking for chartered accountants. She applied, you know, for me and sent off an application. And I got this, uh, uh, you know, call from ITC to come in. I went in there. I was not in the least interested in the job. And, you know, as things always happen, the guy least interested get the, gets the job. So I got the job. And uh, when I went into ITC, I actually, I went into a role that Anto was in. He was senior to me. But very quickly I said, this is not the role I want to be in. I want to go into a completely... Uh, a different path and therefore I actually took the highest risk assignment possible at ITC which was going into the inv investments and diversifications planning area 
and the rest was history because three, four of us created companies like ITC Classic Finance, ITC Agrotech. Some of you may still be using the Sundrop Oil. We created ITC Global Holdings. We created uh, real estate assets. And the last role that I did there was to create a company called ITC Infotech, after which I realized that Infotech was the future area for us. After that, I went into a company called Sintel. Again, highest risk kind of assignment in the market, pioneer in the space. Company was going downhill because for years together, nobody had moved from the old wage arbitrage model to you know, the newer models. I chose that company because I said, this is the company where I can actually showcase my capabilities. Very quickly, took charge of many other areas.